Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, so thank you for the invitation. It's particularly special to be following on from Lord David Putnam, and I can see plenty of potential to use that fact to try and impress some of my friends at dinner parties, but I somehow think they might not believe me, but nevertheless, uh, something of a treat. And yes, I'm here to provide some commentary on outstanding teaching, learning and assessment based on inspection evidence, and also say a little bit about what's coming next in terms of the new common inspection framework that is going to start from September of this year, and which has just been launched. So the plan for the session uh, is, is as shown. So what I hope to cover is a little bit about what inspection evidence tells us about outstanding teaching, learning and assessment, particularly looking at some of the features that are clear in inspection reports where we have judged teaching, learning and assessment to be outstanding. And to follow on from that by saying a little bit about leadership of learning as that comes through in inspection reports. And I know that's a central theme for the work of the Learning Consortium and one of the things that's very much part of the thrust of today's agenda. Then I'll say just a little bit about the new Common Inspection Framework from September 2015. And then we're going to round up by doing a, a question time session and Graham Blench is going to help with that and pose some questions to me. Uh, it may be that we can take some questions from the floor, but I leave that entirely in Graham's capable hands. So, um, unsurprisingly, as I'm an Ofsted inspector, I'm sure you'd expect to see at the beginning of any presentation a slide like this that has got some, some numbers on it. So, here we are. This is the state of play in terms of inspection grades for teaching, learning and assessment in the current reporting year. And these data cover outcomes for inspections in terms of teaching, learning and assessment grades, which have taken place between the 1st of September 2014 and the 31st of May 2015, where the inspection report has been published by the 1st of June. And these data are based on the June management information data that we, we published on the 22nd of June. So that's the source. But obviously, these data are only partway through the academic year, so there's going to be a, a change in how the final picture will look, at, that will look like. But the reason for showing this slide is just to highlight the, the number of grades or the percentage of grades that we give that are outstanding. And if you recall the annual report that the Chief Inspector's annual report that was published um, at the end of the last academic year, 2013-14, uh, you'll perhaps recall that the, the picture then was that about 5% of the inspection grades that we gave for the whole of the inspections that we, that we undertook in that academic year, which amounted to something like, I think, 348 inspections. Only 5% of those grades were graded as outstanding. Now, what these data are showing us now is that even at this point in the academic year, there are still relatively few outstanding grades that are awarded through inspection. Now, I mean, that caused me just to reflect on that a little bit as I was travelling today and, and ask myself, well, well, why do we not, as inspectors, award more outstanding grades? Now, I know you will have a lot of ideas about that, but I'm going to hold the floor at this stage and, and tell you one, some of the reasons why I think that's the case. And these are my own thoughts. I mean, I think there are, there are four points that I'd make. First of all, I think as inspectors, we often see some very good quality teaching, learning and assessment, but we, what we don't see consistently enough is that being widespread across provision. It still tends to be pockets as opposed to consistent mm -hmm. enough. Now, I know you'll say to me, well, you will never get a consistent high quality across a, a provider, particularly a college, for example, 
that has a large number of subject areas. And I, I'm pragmatic enough to, to understand that. But we need to see enough consistently high quality teaching and learning to be able to give outstanding grades. And, and that, I think, is one of the reasons. Secondly, I think that the, the number of changes that have gone on in the sector, the clear focus on improving teaching and learning, and the fact that because that's become so high on the agenda, there have had to be lots of changes in providers, restructuring, refocusing of the culture. I think in some cases, some of that work has not yet come to fruition. So personally, I look forward to being able to award more outstanding <coughs> grades in the future. And my third point in response to thinking this one through is that clearly the challenges placed on the sector in terms of helping students to improve their English and math skills and their employability skills are, are serious challenges. We all know that. My own view is that the sector has responded well, but that it's taken time to do that. And again, I'm hoping that we'll start to see strengths emerging more seriously and more convincingly in that aspect of work. And my final point, and I'm grateful to Tony Noonan, who's my colleague who's here today, who's a senior HMI from the, uh, from the London region, because we had a, a chat in the break, and he said to me that what we sometimes see as inspectors is some rather almost cautious and uninspiring practice during inspection. And one of the commitments that we have made as part of the new way of working from September is that we want to see your everyday practice. We want to see you as you are, and we're going to try and make sure we do as much as possible to try and reduce any of the bureaucracy or complications of inspection so that we can see that. Anyway, uh, moving on to the points I wanted to make about the features of outstanding teaching and learning, and I've drawn on inspection reports in the current academic year to come up with this list, and nothing on that list will be a surprise to you, I don't think, um, and I'll say that they're not, the features are not in any particular order, but seven key things that come through clearly and convincingly in inspection reports about outstanding teaching, learning and assessment. The first point about high expectations is one that I'm sure you will all share in terms of knowing that it's important, but it's got to be high expectations across all aspects of the work in terms of teaching, learning, and assessment. And it's got to be high expectations by all staff, so that it's not just, it's about accountability, isn't it? That everybody has accountability for setting those high expectations. And I think, you know, that is a resoundingly important feature and, of course, what those high expectations mean is that the kind of professional, high-quality relationship, working relationship between learners and staff is securely there. In the inspection reports I looked at, there were many strengths cited in the craft of teaching, whether that be teachers' ability to question, to structure group work, all those things which are the teachers' And when I use the word teachers, I don't just mean teachers in the classroom. I mean teachers, assessors, coaches, mentors, the tools of their trade. And those, doing those aspects of teaching really, really well, giving a, de a demonstration of a technical skill, those are the things that are done resoundingly well. An important point about the teacher's role as a role model and how that can be an excellent form of influencing and inspiring learners. And I always look carefully at, at that sort of relationship because I'm looking to see how a teacher does exactly that, inspires and influence, influences, but I'm also looking to see whether those teachers are prepared to apply a bit of tough love sometimes and not kind of cushion learners so that they're in a comfort zone, but to move them on and to be thinking about their futures and making sure that they know what the industries are like that they're going to move into. And having that passion and enthusiasm in the right measures to make those things work. 
the exceptionally strong pastoral and academic support, no surprises to, to you there. And of course, I would always draw this, the distinction between pastoral and academic, and I think the academic bit is the bit that comes over strongly in outstanding providers. And of course, importantly, excellent planning of learning. Now, that doesn't mean complicated lesson plans, but planning of learning over time, supported by thorough assessment in all its forms. And there's been a lot of work on assessment in the FE sector, which I think is very healthy and productive. The last but one point is about the teacher's role as a facilitator, um, the person who structures and manages the learning experience, which sounds horribly jargonistic, so apologies for that. But that enthusiastic and expert direction makes such sense, I think, when you think of teachers that really make it work for learners, where they structure, prepare well learners to do what it is that they need to do. And of course, the role of feedback is paramount. You don't need me to tell you that. And the final point that came through strongly is about rigorous and constructive use of performance management. And again, that's something that the sector has taken on board um, very robustly and made sure that that really works. And that's certainly a, a feature that came through strongly in the inspection reports that I looked at. Now that leads me neatly on to say a few points about leadership of learning, again arising from inspection reports. And it's clear that what works is getting the right culture and climate for learning. And that's no mean feat. There are many of you in this room that will know that because you've had to tackle changes to do with structures in your organisation, staffing levels, and a raft of things that are about getting the right culture. But it's quite clear that a, a, a culture that's based on sound educational principles, a clear vision that, that permeates all aspects and makes sense to everyone is at the root, the centre of getting the culture right. And getting the climate right that feels good, where there's openness, dial good dialogue, plenty of sharing, and those features are part of the sort of everydayness in a provider. Of course, a role of leadership is to make sure that teachers are developed as all-round practitioners and role models, and that all staff are pulled together in the pursuit of learning. And I think one of the most striking things that's happened in the FE sector is when you look at the role of work-based learning, where, and I say this respectfully, traditionally an assessor would have thought of themselves just as an assessor, and that their job would have been just you know, to tick the boxes in terms of competence. I don't believe that's the case anymore, because assessors in work-based learning see themselves as much more than that now, because of good leadership and making them accountable. And it, it's drawing everybody together in that way. The next point that I've noted is about doing what's needed to improve teachers' practice quickly and very effectively. For some teachers, maybe they just need some tweaks to their practice, and the quicker that can happen, the quicker they can perform at their most effective. But of course, there's a place for sharply focused staff development activities as well. And the final point really goes back to one of my earlier points, is leadership that means that good practice truly is shared and that innovation is supported so that teachers, trainers, assessors are prepared to take risks, to try things out, to be brave. Um, and I guess that was perhaps what Lord Putnam was, was pointing us towards earlier today when he talked about the, uh, the gains in medical science compared to education. That takes me neatly on just to say a, for a very few minutes a few things about what's coming next, the Common Inspection Framework from 2015. I've just got a couple of slides on this because I think many of you will have been to a launch event or will be going to a launch event in your regions and so you will be going to a particular presentation where you'll hear all about the changes that we're making 
and the new way of working. But I thought there were two things that fitted neatly into my presentation to you this afternoon. First of all, to highlight that in the revision, well, they're not revision, sorry, the new common inspection framework, the effectiveness of leadership and management is the first grade that, that appears in the kind of the four grades that we're going to be, the four aspects that we're going to be looking at. And those first two points about increased emphasis on leaders' work in terms of developing culture and vision and also robust performance management, I think highlight the, the points that I made earlier about what comes through from outstanding teaching and learning inspection reports. And you can see there in the, the example from the descriptor for a grade one points about culture, high expectations, and working relationships. And secondly, the, the teaching and learning and assessment key judgment, which is still there and is a very important one. In fact, uh, for those of you who have looked at the handbook already, you'll know that to get an overall effectiveness grade of outstanding, normally teaching, learning and assessment will need to be graded outstanding also. And you can see there points about the focus on teaching and learning, developing knowledge and skills, particularly focused on progression, and the emphasis on assessment. And just the point that, and you'll all know this, I think, that as inspectors, we're going to be moving to not grading observations of learning any longer. However, we will still be identifying strengths and areas for improvement in every learning activity that we undertake. So we're still going to be making those important judgments about the quality, but not attaching a numerical grade. And what we hope is that that will emphasize the fact that we are drawing from a wide evidence base. And my final point is just that, if you didn't already know, we have launched the new arrangements and they are available on our website in terms of the Common Inspection Framework, the Handbook and various other pieces of guidance. So I hope that you'll be able to have a look at that and absorb all the different features of what's coming in September. So that concludes the point that I uh, intended to make in my presentation. So with some trepidation, I'm now going to say that um, I think Graham's going to, or well, we're going to get involved in a bit of a discussion. So I will hand over to you, Graham, to, to lead us through that. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? You all right? Yes, good, good thanks. Good. <laughs> wow, um, I'm not sure what all this is about. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of questions. <laughs> two, two things as a, as, a, as a kind of leader in a college keep me awake at night, many things, but two things particularly. Um, one's the study programme um, and the work element within it, and the other one is maths and English. Um, can we start with maths and English? Uh, yes, yes, why not? So, what must colleges and providers do to further improve the teaching across the piece of maths and English? All right. Well, I'm going to draw on the evidence from what I see during inspection. I mean, I, I, I can't say what should or shouldn't be done. Yeah. I can only tell you what I think I can see works well in inspection. The thing that I see, and I do a lot of inspection, is that there are some real strengths developing in the building of specialist teams around English and maths, and in some cases, drawing from, for example, the school sector to strengthen those teams, and using those teams to do some really imaginative work on schemes of work, for example, for teaching GCSEs, particularly that are based on a robust skills analysis so that it's clear where learners need to bolster their skills in terms of maths and English. Because I think we all know that it simply doesn't work just to go through the whole of the GCSE syllabus again, necessarily. Now, I mean, it may in some cases, but principally, there needs to be the focus on the bits that are most challenging. So I can see strengths emerging around where those specialist teams are developed. And sometimes those can be teams that are sort of developed from a provider's staff through training and development. 
But the other strand that I think is emerging very strongly is the close work between specialist teachers and, and I'm going to call them vocational teachers for want of a better title, where there's really close working, very supportive collaboration so that there's that kind of seamlessness across a provider's work to make maths and English skills central to a learner's programme and really build on the strengths in that way. And I think those are some, some points that certainly from my inspection evidence have emerged strongly. Now that may not be the case in your organisations, you may do it differently, but I'm sure you'd all agree that, it, that this, the working together of specialists and non-specialists and learning from each other is a very productive way forward. That's probably not the magic answer you were looking for, but I think it's, it's the best advice Get, that I can give based on inspection evidence. Getting the specialists in the first place is a bit of an issue, put it mildly. So my advice is develop a really good relationship with your VP for finance and then introduce the concept of uh, market supplement because that's what we've had to do and it, it gets a bit eye-watering. You know, the kind well, of market supplements, which is, you know... You're the expert yeah, there, but, and I appreciate oh. your point. Um, the other one's about the, the key thing is about the study programme, the work element within it. And there, there are many different ways to approach that. But in terms of the impacts that you would anticipate to see or you would like to see, as not, not you personally, but, you know, what impacts would you appreciate within the work element? Good, good question, and I know it's... Um, it's an important issue for you all. I mean, the thrust of the framework that we use to inspect is that students develop employability skills to prepare them for progression. And for us as inspectors, some of the things that, that we like to see as part of that package are that there's a clear analysis of where a student may have gaps in their skill basis set against a framework of what are the important skills that learners need to achieve for progression and for employment. And, and we know that a lot of you are doing some really good work on being very clear on what the skills framework that learners need to work against is. And importantly, what we also want to see is the fact that the work or the uh, work experience, the work-related learning is individualised for students to, to make sure that they get those skills. And for many of them, you will all know how important it is that they get those skills in an external, unfamiliar setting. And we know that is a big challenge for the sector, but we also know that a lot of you are doing a lot of things to try and make sure that happens to help improve the learner's chances. And importantly, the other thing that I think sometimes doesn't always get the emphasis that it should get is that where students do work experience, developing their employability skills, is there must be an element of assessment in all of that and feedback. Because it's not just a matter of a tick box exercise. Yes, they've done their external work experience, so be it. It's got to fit into that framework of developing their skills, plugging where they have skills gaps so that they get the very best chance to be able to progress. So please don't forget the assessment and the feedback aspect of it, as well as setting it against the framework of skills that, that learners need to achieve. OK. Um, I've got one, I'm just mindful of the time, so I've got one kind of final question. You've got the new SIF coming out, and that's a, a cycle has, has gone. So within teaching and learning uh, and, and assessment practice, what, what have been the really salient improvement points over the last sort of three or four years? Yes, I did have a little bit of advanced warning of this one, so I have been able yeah. to give a little bit of thought to it. Uh, my, my view is that, and I think obviously this is shared through inspectors' <coughs> evidence, is there's just been such a huge increase in the dialogue about teaching, learning and assessment, and I think that's been healthy, productive, meaningful for teaching and learning in the sector overall. And the fact that, for example, we're all here today under the banner of a learning consortium developing uh, higher level teaching and learning skills, that's got to say a lot about where the sector's moved from to. And if I reflect back on my early days in FE, which is a long, long time ago, teaching and learning just simply didn't get a look in on management agendas. I mean, it was something that sort of happened down the corridor and managers, principals, I say that respectfully, 
weren't particularly interested in teaching and learning, but I think that's not the case now. It's really central to the work of providers. And I think there is a much clearer view of what pedagogy in FE really means now. And the growth in practitioner research, I think, is fantastic. I mean, I picked up the, the booklet um, on some of the, the case studies that have been done as part of the Learning Consortium, and, and it's great to read those things. So I think those, those uh, improvements have really had an impact on the sector. And I think learners get a much more rounded experience as a result. And I think the other important point that I want to mention is that I think that the professional status of teachers has improved considerably. I mean, that period of time where, whether you like it or not, there was a mandatory requirement for teaching qualifications, that started to redress some of the, the balance with, with school teachers and, and started to recognise FE teachers for their, their skills, their credibility, um, and, the, and the good job that they do in the sector. And I'm really pleased that that's the case because it's always been a belief of mine that FE teachers are highly professional and have a very valuable place in the education sector. What do you think, Graham? About what? <laughs> About what have been the most, uh, the most significant improvements? I think flipping it round, and, and instead of being a, it being a performative thing of the person at the front performing teaching, I think the most salient thing is flipping it around to look at the impact of that on them. Mm. So the impact of, I think there's a, a, a much greater kind of for, sharper focus on the impact of the teaching practice, the impact on the assessment practice, the impact of the CPD, not on the, on the performativity of the teacher, but on, on the outputs of the learner. No, That's I'm not, with you all the way there. Yeah. That's oh, a very good very point. reassuring. For, yes. very <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, yeah, thank that's you. It. And Marcos, look, it's one minute. Time. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> thank you.